So I had earlier talked about the elephant in the room, um, but this time maybe a crocodile in the room. You're uh, <laughs> from British American Tobacco, and you want to talk about sustainability. Mm. But let's, let's clear the air. Um, if there is a, an industry that uh, people in this room might find more suspect beyond big oil is probably big tobacco. Mm -hmm. So tell us, wh why are you here to talk about sustainability uh, as a tobacco company? What does this mean, uh, and what are people not understanding if, they're, if they have their back up against you? Yeah, I mean, uh, BAT has been around for 125 years. It was founded in 1908. Um, it has delivered uh, pleasure to consumers worldwide, but with one fundamental problem, and that is the harm uh, that our product, when used as intended, when it's burnt, causes. Now, some people will say, some people in the room are probably thinking, why don't you just stop doing what you're doing? The, the, the problem with that is that's, that's creating a supply-side solution to a demand-side problem. So even if we stop selling our combustible products, it doesn't mean that the world usage of those is going to reduce. So we need a better idea, and that idea is harm reduction. How do we provide uh, tobacco and nicotine solutions for consumers who enjoy the product and gain satisfaction from it to use those products in a way that's less harmful? And we embarked on that journey uh, somewhere around 2012. Uh, it started here in the USA uh, with Reynolds, with the Views product. Uh, and now we have about 100 million consumers worldwide who use uh, these new category nicotine products. About 17% of our revenues now are in products that don't burn. And that's the kind of societal impact, the societal endeavor that we've embarked on to bring what we call a better tomorrow, to bring this a better tomorrow purpose alive. And my, my, my final thought on, on, on the opening question, Vijay, is I think in the world of sustainability, it's not about it's not about where you start from, it's where you're trying to get to. So tell us where you're trying to get to, and, and uh, bring us to the sustainability part of the story, right? I mean, yeah. look, you operate in a legal enterprise, and we're a liberal paper at The Economist. We yes. believe people, yeah. as long as they're informed, can make sure. their own choices. If they want to smoke something that kills them, that's their choice. As, yes. uh, although as society, we may not like it, or sure. as individuals, we may choose otherwise. Yeah. Um, as a legal enterprise operating in a, a controversial industry, you want to talk about sustainability. What are you doing that's more sustainable than you were doing 10 years ago? Of course. Our, our ambition is to, is to think about a business where about half of our revenues by 2035 are in products that don't burn. And, and I would say, as, as tobacco and nicotine is regulating harder and harder, you know, a parallel market, something like cannabis, is deregulating. So I think we also need to think about the intelligence of the regulatory landscape we're working with. Um, I think you can look forward to a day, I think you can think about a day where BAT will have transformed fully from a cigarette business to a business that no longer sells cigarettes. I believe there will be a day where BAT will sell its last cigarette. But if you look at our... So uh, if BP wanted to go beyond petroleum, you're going to go beyond tobacco. Yeah, I, I think you'll see that we're fast turning from sort of British American tobacco to almost British American technologies. We spend a lot of time now on, on innovation, on R&D, uh, on device technology, on understanding the interaction uh, between the consumer and these products to make these products satisfying. Because if they're going to replace, if we're going to phase out cigarettes, yeah. then those products have to be satisfying. But I just wanted to say, VJ, as well, on our DMA, it's not just about harm reduction. You know, we're doing a lot of work on, on, on climate. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on um, communities. We're doing a lot of work on nature. Oh, give uh, us an example. Get, get concre uh, concrete with us. So what is course. the re relevance to climate or, or the sustainability topic of the day? Well, we're, we're one of the most uh, vertically integrated agricultural businesses in the world. Sure. We have tens of thousands of farmers. Uh, now, we're on a very interesting journey with them because obviously we're seeing uh, tobacco demand reduce. We have to work with them, uh, uh, encouraging them to think about alternative crops, uh, in, improve yield, uh, work with the communities of those farmers to try and uh, eliminate uh, child and forced labour through educational practices. Uh, and that's something that BAT has been doing for probably, you know, decades and decades and decades. Uh, on circularity, we're now designing product development in. You know, we have a we have a vapor product. Do we want to be able to remove that lithium ion battery? Is that something we want the consumer to be able to do? We think yes. Mm. So we're now designing that in at a higher cost of goods sold to ensure that we're taking uh, our innovation pipeline responsibly. So th these are all examples of, of what are you other areas. Replacing the lithium ion with 
replacing the lithium ion. No, we're, we're, you can take it out of the device so oh, it can be disposed of rather oh, than being, rather than being lock, disposable, locked up. Uh, you know, who, who removes their lithium ion device from uh, the battery from any device they use? We're now building in the innovation pipeline the ability to have those removed so they can be more easily recycled. Circularity. Yeah, right. Exactly. I see. And uh, you mentioned the agriculture piece of this. Obviously, um, land use, uh, agriculture is a significant contributor sure. to climate change. How are you thinking about, and will also be affected by climate change, as we've discussed sure. with our, our, our prior speaker um, uh, from Nespresso. Mm -hmm. uh, how are your, uh, you know, where are you sourced from? How sure. far up the supply chain do you go? How do you think about mm -hmm. the effects of climate change, as well as uh, maybe uh, some technical assistance or working with farmers that are involved in your supply chain? Sure, no, we, we, we do an awful lot. I mean, we've been, uh, quite apart from anything else, we've had programs all around the world. I think we've, we've planted 400 million um, saplings uh, in the last 30 years. Uh, we have commitments to carbon neutrality, uh, which is scope one, two, three, net zero by 2050, uh, halfway there by 2030. Uh, from our baseline in 2020, we reduced uh, scope one and two by 33% in, in 2023. Uh, and, and really the most important thing is we work on farmer sustainability as that world demand for tobacco decreases to make sure that the, the, the economic prosperity of those farmers is able to turn into alternative crops, uh, provide education solutions, uh, and we work with them very, very closely. We have farmer, um, farmer livelihood program called Thrive. We have individual techn technicians that go to those farms uh, to work with them, uh, and also providing uh, to broader reaches of those communities. In, in, in Pakistan, for instance, we mm. put in 28 uh, water treatment plants. That provides uh, water to up to eight million people in, in eight different cities across Pakistan. So it's, it's, it's a combination of factors to try and ensure that, you know, sometimes I get asked by my CEO, I get asked by our board, what is this all about? Mm -hmm. and, and in summary for me, it's about us doing the right thing right. And that can mean a lot of things, but it's, it's a powerful expression to say that our, what we've really got to do is transform our product portfolio but that doesn't mean we're not paying attention to the other areas of our sustainability journey. Well, you mentioned the board and senior leadership. Yeah. That's a conversation we've been having all day, and many in this room have mm. to go and sell some of their ideas yeah. to sometimes skeptical CFOs, for yes. example, yes. say, you know, why are we yes. doing this? Yes. Or, or, and certainly boards will ask tough questions. Um, what kind of answers, or what, uh, do you get, other than a, a nice catchphrase, I mean, it was, uh, don't get me wrong, it was, <laughs> it was attractive, but I can't imagine anyone on a board being of persuaded course. by that. What metrics do you present or how do you persuade uh, tough-minded yeah. financially oriented people that some of these investments like the water uh, yeah. you know tree planting or water for Pakistan um, yes. are actually in their self-interest well you know there, there are always trade-offs I, I, mean, I think that's where you're going and as we think about deployment of both operating expenses and capital that there, there, there are always trade-offs I mean if there, if there weren't trade-offs it's too easy isn't it you know if we if we could do everything we wanted to do in terms of our sustainability journey uh, at, at, at the same or less cost, then I don't think we're tackling the things we need to do. And my answer actually is, is valuation okay. uh, to your question. Uh, and at the end of the day, a company's enterprise value is founded on two things fundamentally. Um, one of them is its trading performance, mm -hmm. and the other one is the belief in that company's sustainability. And that has impacts uh, in terms of you know, terminal growth rates. Um, so there might be a perception that, that our industry, that our company, mm -hmm is one that has not got a sustainable future. Uh, that would lower valuation. If we can work to ensure that there is a feeling that we do have a higher growth, sustainable future, mm -hmm. that can impact valuation on the upside. I see. That speaks really you know, right to the heart of a CFO, to a CEO, to PLC boards, to Exco's, yeah. um, because it's about doing the right thing right, but also creating value for our, uh, in this case, our shareholders. Um, well, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great answer. That's certainly the language of CFOs and the board. Yeah. Um, we have a question from the floor. It says, you know, are you contemplating brand extensions or product extensions to cannabis? Yeah. And well, how do you see the cannabis market? You mentioned it in passing, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, is that something that you're thinking about? Yeah, well, more than thinking about, we're actually, we're actually doing. We, we, we have, uh, I think, uh, currently about 30% uh, of uh, business called Organogram in Canada. 
Uh, we have a minority. And how do you keep that sustainable is the other yeah. half of that question. Yeah, and I'll, 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 I'll touch on that. We have a, an investment in Charlotte's Web here in the United States, uh, and we have an investment in a German uh, cannabis. Are these hedging strategies, or how do you see that? Uh, no, that growth think, is also part of your portfolio. Yeah, no, I don't think they're hedging strategies. I think the, the problem with the cannabis market is it's very inaccessible. Mm -hmm. So, on, Are you kidding? Any street corner in Manhattan, you can get cannabis now. Yeah, I don't well, know that's talking the, about well, now. well, you know, then you get into things like proceeds of Crime Act. So were we to come into the United States, we wouldn't be able to remit funds to the UK. It's not been uh, regulated by the feds, only at state level. So it's not something that a responsible global corporate could enter. So the, the accessible market for cannabis is small. Mm. Do we think that the future tra trajectory is deregulation? Yes. Uh, and we see that in Switzerland, in Germany, in the United States. Canada is deregulated almost entirely. So I think there is a growth opportunity. Uh, in the medium to long term, what we're really trying to do is, is plant the seeds of that ecosystem and actually work mostly on, on what I call upstream, which is R&D developments, product development, uh, understanding um, you know, the agri supply chain, um, to get ready for a world where I think there'll be more commercialization opportunities for cannabis. Can you see a day where your dominant product is cannabis in your portfolio? You said 30% at some point. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, we, the, the first thing we've got to do is think about this in steps. So until 2012, every product that BAT had sold was a combustible tobacco product. Mm -hmm. First wave of our transformation is to take the 1.1 billion smokers worldwide and offer them a, a, a harm reduced alternative to enjoy tobacco and nicotine. So there's now about 100 million of those worldwide plenty of runway left for us to drive growth from alternative nicotine. But now if that, you, that perspective on public health is widely held in the UK, including yeah. by the authorities, yeah. not as much here in the US, I think you'll know, the perspectives yeah. are different here. Uh, so it's a harder sell here. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, the FDA has a very, has a very clear pathway for uh, products that protect public health to be approved. Um, I think what's happened is that in the execution of that regulation, uh, the bureaucratic burden of so many people applying for, for products. I mean, the FDA has approved 24 harm-reduced products uh, in the United States. Um, they've probably had well in excess of 10 million applications. 10 million? 10 million, yes. And now a lot of them just get rejected and, and some of them enter into the process. Sure. But just to give you an idea, our, our Views Alto vapor product mm. The application for that is 100,000 pages long. It's an entire trunker of a lorry. And I think that, you know, we just have to think about the regulatory slate around the world, and it's also true when it comes to ESG reporting, is there is an excessive burden being placed on corporations. There is a disparate burden being placed on corporations. Uh, and this is not value-added spend. You know, complying with CSRD in, in Europe, spending $30 million on that, that is not necessarily value-added spend if you're, a, if you're an investor. So I think the more that we can bring around consistency of the regulatory frameworks, whether it be in reporting of ESG data or whether it be in, you know, in my case, tobacco harm reduction uh, and the story about the FDA, that, that would help us because it would make it um, a, a, a slicker route through to consumer. Um, uh, last question from our floor. Um, it's very often found in uh, articles talking about big oil to compare big oil to big tobacco. Mm -hmm. Maybe because journalists are lazy, we just like big industries that nobody mm -hmm. likes and we like to compare them. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see the situation that big oil is in, especially when executives are called up in front of Congress, they tend to have CEO, you know, uh, innovate, uh, this kind of uh, name and shame theater. Um, uh, do you see, uh, what is the analogy? Where does it work? And where do you think there's a difference uh, when we talk about the comparisons? Yeah, I mean, pe people, people love easy metaphors, don't they? And uh, I often get that put to me uh, by journalists that, you know, you're very much like big oil. I, th I think it is very different. Um, if you think about their marketplace, they control price much less, mm -hmm. if you think about it. Um, whereas we're a consumer products business where... Um, pricing, uh, we go direct to the consumer for all of our business rather than for some of our business. But on the other hand, there are, there are um, similarities. You know, we're trying to transform a product portfolio from a legacy one, which leaves its harm footprint on the world, figure out how we're going to become more sustainable and, and transform into a business, you know, for the future. So there are similarities, but there, there are differences. Um, you know, I, I, the, the other one that comes up often is, you know, is this your Kodak 
exact moment. Right. You know, I, again, I could paint the similarities and differences. I, I think sometimes they're, they're slightly superficial metaphors, but of course there's some similarities. Yeah. Well, I, I would say uh, Sir Walter Raleigh uh, will hardly recognize the industry as he brought tobacco back to the English court famously back in the day, right. uh, uh, centuries ago. Um, uh, thank you for, for sharing the story about your uh, perspective on sustainability. Not at all. Thank you Great. for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.